Okay, for real, one more, then I go to bed. Self control, please. What? Lorenzo, no, no, please. Oh my god. I guess I'll check this out then. Mysterious pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China. How the illness is transmitted has not been identified. The countries has tripled the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. This is a global pandemic. So, what is this project about? Rolling action. The objective of this project was to compile a code based on the SIR model backbone to simulate how COVID-19 has spread and what factors help most in limiting the spread of a disease. As you follow along, we will explain the computation of our coded simulation and its graphic production based on different set parameters. We will discuss and analyze these results together to better understand what factors affect the spread of a disease. The parameters that are researched in this experiment include social distancing, central hubs, hygiene, and quarantining. Now, before we dive into the insights of this project, a little background. COVID-19 is a disease caused by one of the mutated types of coronaviruses called SARS-CoV-2, which was first detected in Wuhan, China in November of 2019. It's a zoonotic virus, which means that it first appeared in animals and was then transmitted to humans. The virus spreads through droplets by coughing, sneezing, communication, and even contaminated surfaces. The symptoms of COVID-19 can vary. An individual can be asymptomatic, obtain minor symptoms common to the flu, like a fever or even a dry cough, or the infection can lead to possible fatal outcomes. Due to its high level of contagiousness and therefore its fast spread, the World Health Organization on March 11th of 2020 declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Coronavirus symptoms can take an average of five to six days to appear, so it's easy to spread it well before you even notice you're feeling sick. Mathematical simulation models are used to analyze and understand the cause and effects of a disease spread. The SRI model that we specifically use in this experiment uses the stochastic model to capture uncertainty and variability, which is intrinsic in real life diseases. This mathematical model predicts at any given time, the number of individuals susceptible to infection, actively infected, or that have recovered from infection. Other models exist, such as the SEIR, SIS, and SEIS. However, these are more mathematically in-depth and detailed in ways that our team over four weeks was unable to decipher. Therefore, we chose to focus on the SRI model because it benefited our strengths and gave an overarching simplicity to the understanding of a disease spread. However, the simplicity also leads to notions within the model that are not always adequate to relate to real life. This demonstration is meant to be a tool to explore modeling methods and parameter changes. No mathematical simulation model can perfectly predict the future or the course of a disease. Yet, a good model provides an approximation that is reliable and accurate enough for furthering scientific research and educating the public. As the British statistician George Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. We browsed the web and searched for some inspiration, and we found this presentation by Joe Mahoney. Infectious disease spread uh, using MATLAB as the programming language. He explained the simple SIR model he had created in MATLAB. We found his contact details, we emailed Joe, and within five minutes we got a reply. We committed to this code and started to plan possible ways we could add to it. We found multiple other resources that helped us getting started. We also looked at the other softwares and online tools that could help with the overall understanding of the underlying maths. We use GeoGebra to make a simple SRI model using differential equations. We can flatten the curve of infection in two ways. We can decrease the transmission rate, which means stopping people from talking to each other, i.e. social distancing. 
We can also increase the recovery rate, however, this is much harder to do in practice. Despite being a popular tool to model disease spread, the SRI model makes several assumptions. First of all, the agents can only move within a square area. They begin randomly distributed, they move at random, and they have the same time distribution of going from infected to removed. Secondly, we know if agents are susceptible, infected, or recovered at all times. And lastly, removed agents cannot become reinfected nor spread infection. That was a lot of preamble. Let's switch over to MATLAB and have a look at the baseline simulation. We made a box and put these agents in. For this simulation, we determined the population N. We distributed them randomly inside a square and then randomly infected 5% of the population. What we have here are the parameters. We're going to model our recovery as coming from a normal distribution with a mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 1.5. The infection radius is 0.1. This is saying how close a susceptible person has to be to an infected person to have a chance to become infected. On any day, an agent is going to move four times. The code is going to check if they are infected and so on. If we run the code, we can actually see what's going on. The red dots are the infected agents, the blue ones are susceptible. As blue dots get closer to red dots, they have a linearly increasing chance of getting infected. The graph on the right shows the infection curve in red and the susceptible and removed curves in blue and green respectively. We haven't changed anything, but every time we run this, the initial distribution of the agents is different, their movement is going to be different, and so is their recovery time. All this randomness coming into play changes the results of the model. So how does it become useful if every time we run it, we will have different results? In order to account for that uncertainty, we conducted a probabilistic analysis. We ran something called a Monte Carlo simulation that's going to account for all these alternate universes. We test for convergence by running enough of these alternate universes to get a 95% confidence interval of what the peak infection rate is going to be. So this is, in our theoretical pandemic, one scenario that could happen. But there are things we can change. Parameters that we in the model have control over and that have some analogs to the real world. We thought of a number of policies that we wanted to implement which would affect our pandemic and we thought of what these meant in terms of the code. We implemented each policy from our checklist. We started things simple and layered on more complexity gradually. Let's take a look at how to quantify the spread. The number of people that one infected person on average will pass on a virus to is known as R, the effective reproductive number. R0 is the value of R in a fully susceptible population, like at the beginning. In our simulation, we took the number of total daily infections and divided by the mean recovery rate. The first thing we wanted to implement was a simple change. What will happen if we halve the infection radius? This means less total interactions between people or a less socially engaged society. The effect is quite drastic. Now what if we instead we decrease the probability of infection? This could be better hand washing or wearing face masks. We expected this to have a similar result as decreasing the infection radius. However, minimal difference was observed. We believe this was due to limitations in our code. Finally, by decreasing both values, we got the best results. As you can see, it spreads out this curve. This shows how changes to hygiene have a really big effect on the rate of spreading. Right now, ages move randomly and aimlessly during the day. In order to simulate daily life, we created a central hub that agents can visit. Every agent has a probability of 2% of visiting this hotspot. Compared to the baseline simulations, the results are mostly the same. However, the agents got infected and removed a bit faster than the do-nothing scenario. Next, we halved the infection radius and decreased the infection chance. As expected, the infection curve was flattened in comparison to the first central hub run, when no hygiene measures were put in place. Lastly, the probability of visiting the central hub was increased to 10%. Although hygiene measures were still in place, the higher probability made the infection curve peak emphasizing the drastic effects that hotspots, such as markets and squares, can have on the spread of a disease. Next on the list was quarantining. This was done by identifying and isolating whoever was infectious. With 100% of the population quarantining, the number of infectious per day is the lowest. So what if 10% of the population is asymptomatic? The average peak of cases per day is above 100. The curve tails off as they pass and the infection does not reach the entire population. Now we can try a scenario where 50% of the population quarantines. In this situation, almost the entire population became infected and at a faster rate resembling the first central hub run. 
Lastly, the social distancing parameter is introduced. When we look at each graph of the decreasing population following a new measure, we see an inclination until day 9 and afterwards a gradual decline. If we were to compare the social distancing parameter to the central hub, the graph looks almost exactly the same. It is important to keep in mind that it is imperfect so that our simulation cannot model perfect social distancing. So, what can we conclude? During this project, we found out the various limitations associated with modeling the current pandemic using an SIR model. In spite of this being an oversimplification, we hope that simulations like the one you saw today provides valuable insight and helps policymakers, scientists, as well as the society better understand the spread of a disease. By running the simulation multiple times while changing the parameters, we concluded that quarantining and decreasing both the radius of infection and the chance of infection are the most effective in preventing the spread of the disease. Social distancing has not proven to have much of an effect in our simulation, however, that might just be due to some imperfections in our code. Finally, a central app has only shown to increase the spread of a disease. The code we devised could be further adapted to account for a number of things. An example is to include the time frame from when an individual is exposed to the virus to when they actually become contagious. Another aspect to consider could be the differences in ages and immune systems, and therefore accounting for different probabilities of becoming infected as well as of the chance of becoming reinfected. Lastly, instead of randomly distributing the agents at the beginning, we could have them clustered in certain areas, such as homes, stores and central hubs. The main takeaway is that numerical methods such as the SRI model have proven to be powerful tools with regards to the spread of a disease. By assisting in decision making, these models could provide an education and scientific background into the understanding of the spread of a disease such as COVID-19. Thank you for watching and if you have any questions, let us know.